creating spaces where people don't feel ashamed for the way that their systems have tried to adapt to overwhelm. Like instead of judging yourself for what you reached for in desperation, could you recognize that you reached for it in desperation and then take that what you reached for as important information about what you need? Welcome to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel, a podcast that illuminates the path to collective healing at the intersection of science and mysticism. In his conversations with visionaries, innovators, artists, and healers, Thomas invites guests into a relational experience that allows inspiration and innovation to emerge. This is The Point of Relation. Our guest for today's episode is Mary Catherine McDonald. Mary Catherine McDonald, PhD, is a research professor and life coach who specializes in the psychology of trauma, stress, and resilience. She has been researching, lecturing, and publishing on neuroscience, psychology, and lived experience of trauma and stress for over a decade. She is passionate about destigmatizing trauma, stress, and mental health issues, as well as reframing our understanding of trauma in order to better understand and treat it. We hope you enjoy this conversation. Hello and welcome to The Point of Relation. My name is Thomas Hübel. This is my podcast. And I'm very happy to be sitting here with uh, Mary Catherine McDonald, MC. (laughs) Uh, First of all, warm welcome. Uh, Thank you so much. I am so honored to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so happy to see you. You're already radiating so much joy into this place. So it it makes me feel delighted. And uh, I'm so glad. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. And it seems like we we do have like a lot of passions in common. Like uh, we both are passionate about okay, deeper understanding the trauma response depathologizing trauma, seeing Mm -hmm. how we can work with its intelligence and basically how we can heal, grow, flourish and um, how relationships are important on the path to healing. And um, so that all sounds great. And let's, let's see, maybe you can speak a little bit because like trauma is like the buzzword at the moment. So maybe you speak a little bit about your understanding your research your teaching about trauma how can we look at trauma maybe mm-hmm. how is trauma sometimes used the word to describe something else maybe and mm-hmm. let's start here yeah let's start there exactly the the way the word is used is really fascinating because i think that the word trauma and this is true of many words they kind of fall in and out of favor and they mean different things in different moments and the history of the study of trauma as you know is very episodic there are these moments where it sort of shoots to be the most important, most used word, and then it kind of falls out of favor so much so that the word becomes taboo. And so I think the way that we use this word right now is really interesting because we are using it to describe many, many things. And I think when, as a society, when our language becomes hyperbolic, it's really important that we pay attention to that because I think it's trying to reveal something that's true. The definition that I use to to define trauma is anytime you have two things happening at the same time, an unbearable emotional experience that lacks a relational home. Those are the two criteria. Mm -hmm. And I came to that definition after a very long time in academia, trying to understand why we were still arguing about the definition of trauma after 150 years of pretty sustained study in psychology about what what trauma actually is. And I think just to unpack that a little bit, I love the fact that I think that unbearability as a word does a lot of work because it, it says that like it raises the bar sufficiently high so that I don't get to say that anything in my horizon is traumatic. It has to be something that I either struggle to bear in the moment or that becomes unbearable over time. So when you go to Starbucks and there's no pumpkin spice syrup, that may be traumatic depending on the context, of course, but likely if you're using that word in that case and it's not traumatic, that's kind of raising a flag to something else. And then the second part, 
about the relational home, I think it helps us understand both what we need when we are traumatized and also the incredible amount of of hope there is when it comes to what we can give each other when we're living in a particularly traumatic time like now, right? Um, our experiences, I think, all need a dwelling place. And when we can't find one, we can help each other find a dwelling place relationally. And that's mm -hmm. a critical aspect to understanding both how trauma impacts us and then also how to heal. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. I love both. And um, and I like this finding a home. I will, I will come back to the home aspect in a moment. Maybe you can speak a little bit to how did you come to look at trauma so deeply? Mm. Like, well, what called you? When did you feel, wow, trauma research, that's my thing? <laughs> like, how, yeah. did, how did life call you into that? And what are the components maybe that on your path that you see that enabled that, made it possible? Was the pressure towards that? I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's such a funny thing because I think depending on the day, I could draw the line all the way back to when I was tiny, you know, mm -hmm. um, because I think when I was a little kid, I was very uh, preoccupied with loss and death in a way that most children probably aren't. Um, but fast forwarding significantly, um, I was doing my uh, master's degree and studying loss and mourning and sort of what from an, mm -hmm. kind of an interdisciplinary perspective. So I was at the new school, so I was looking at it from psychoanalytic and philosophical backgrounds. What, what does loss look like? Why are some losses particularly shattering over others, regardless of what your relationship was like with the person that you lost? And then what does that do to the self? And mm -hmm. while I was, while I kind of embarked on that study, both of my parents suddenly died in, in very mm -hmm. kind of shocking in sudden ways. And um, so then I embarked on a PhD program. I switched schools and started studying the self more intensely. And I wanted to look at the extent to which the self is a story or maybe isn't, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I kept seeing, and I think this was, I don't think I was very consciously aware of this at the moment, but it certainly was alive in my life, is that when you've had a trauma, something shatters, like some story you were telling, some through line seems to really blow up. And so I reached for trauma as a kind of a case study in a larger work about identity. And when I did that, um, I just fell down this rabbit hole because I realized, you know, when I went to reach for it, I thought like, okay, well, we've been looking at trauma since, you know, at least the 1800s. So we should be pretty clear mm -hmm. <laughs> on what it is and how to treat it. And what I found was that there was an incredible amount of debate about which kinds of things count as traumatic, which do not. Are we supposed to be looking at this from a phenomenological viewpoint or a neuroscientific viewpoint or a psychological viewpoint? And no one was kind of bringing, and very few people were bringing um, all those disciplines together. And so I started, so I fell down this rabbit hole. I started grabbing from neuroscience and from um, phenomenology and from psychology to try to create a more holistic, I called it a prismatic account of trauma. Like if we use these disciplines to help shine both on each other and this phenomenon, what, what kind of understanding do we come out with? Um, and then simultaneously, I started working with clients as a life coach. I got a, a coaching certification and started working with clients, many of whom I found were in traditional therapy and getting very little help with understanding how trauma was impacting their lives and what to do about it. And so, and so on, I trudged kind of working in this strange, non-traditional way in multiple disciplines and in this coaching world. Um, and then eventually that kind of all came together into this last book that I wrote called Unbroken, which kind of aims to synthesize all of that, all of those years of study and work with clients to get out a new definition and understanding of trauma. Mm. And that new definition or new understanding of trauma, could you lay that out a bit for us? Yes. So very early on when I was studying trauma in terms of the biology, I became completely obsessed with the fact that the trauma response is adaptive. 
this is a set of coping mechanisms that that come into our bodies, our beings. They're hardwired. They come, it's like default software. Um, mm-hmm. And they're there to keep us alive. So at its biological base, the trauma response is the body's natural response to threat. And we were reading it from psychology and from society as if it were a sign of weakness. It's the opposite. Mm. The trauma response is a, is, a, is a strength response, not a sign of weakness or disorder. And then it was like, okay, if we start there and try to unravel all of these years of shame and incorrect science and oppression, if we strip that away, what does the healing path look like? And when we begin with this idea that what these responses, even when they become maladaptive over time, they are still at their basis trying to help you adapt. So if we can look at it from that beginning point, what then does healing look like? And then what kinds of you know science-based tools can we get out to people so that they can help wrangle their own symptoms? And then also, you know, that becomes sort of... Uh, expansive, right? Because you heal your trauma and then you also are healing other people's. This changes the way you relate to each other. And so on and on and on. I forgot Mm. the question. Did Mm. I answer? Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Beautiful. First of all, I love that. I love that the destigmatization of Mm -hmm. trauma and seeing the intelligence in the trauma response. It's it's wild. Yeah. It's wild, it's exactly. A miracle, yeah. Yeah, it's it's wild, and and that also changes our relationship, like the relationship of many people that work on their trauma, but also our relationship to the trauma yes. that we mm-hmm. support in the healing process. Because we are mm-hmm. not trying to get rid of something, we are trying to create a partnership with an intelligence, and then it can move forward. That's that's amazing. And so, mm-hmm. how did you? How did? Or how, how did? Or how do you work with? With the stigmatization of trauma as either a weakness or a part of myself that I want to hide or something that I want to get rid of. And when when your clients or coaches, uh, in a way, come to you, um, how did you see that stigmatization creating a blockage or not in their process? And what what is helpful to learn to to change our relationship to our own traumatization. I think this is where I I was so blown away by your recent book attuned because you talk about attunement to the, to the self and also attunement to each other in our, you know, interpersonal relationships and then also to society. But I think when we begin with attunement to the self, because attunement is fundamentally Mm non-judgmental. It is, I I talk and I was I'm so grateful for your work because I was reaching for language that didn't feel like it was matching what I was trying to say. I kept talking about how the body is a barometer. And if we learn how to read it, we get so much information about what we need, what situation we're actually in, what someone else may need, you know. Um mm-hmm. and so I think the first thing that I try to do with with a client is to sort of meet them where they are and try to figure out like, okay, what what symptoms are coming through? And you can see that pretty immediately when you meet somebody, someone is very anxious or gripped or um, constricted or boundaryless and sort of um, inside out, you know? Um, yeah. And so I kind of try to meet them with they are where they are. And then I'm trying to attune to their barometer and also trying to educate them about their barometer see what your body is doing, see what your system is is trying to tell you. What is the default narrative that's rolling around in your mind that's kind of running in the background that you may not have ever really clued into? What is it saying? Mm -hmm. Whose voice is it? And then I think, so a lot of that is about sort of re-education. You know, it's like you meet yourself for the first time. Mm-hmm. Who am I? What what is my body doing? What does it need? And that that I think is a humbling (laughs) it has been for me a very humbling experience because you realize that you don't know yourself and that can be kind Mm -hmm. of scary. So it's important Mm -hmm. to kind of get into that slowly. And then I think um, this, the destigmatization is something that has to continue to happen because it's so entangled in our narrative about symptoms in general. If you have a symptom, it is pathology that, um, 
someone can cognitively know that the trauma response is adaptive and then and then still feel shame about mm-hmm. the fact that they're having symptoms. And so um, constantly keeping that in check, constantly reminding each other what we already know, which is that, yes, you're having this symptom and no, it's nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, the shame is the biggest barrier in your way of healing. And mm-hmm. if we can just, I try to get clients to just take the shame and sort of put it in a box and put it on a high shelf. Like you don't have to get rid of it. Cause I think we, I think shame is an adaptation too. And when we try to take things away from people, they grip harder. And so it's like, what would things look like? Let's just try this on. If you put your shame on a high shelf for a second, and then we looked at this problem or this symptom. And then I think kind of the last thing is reframing healing. This is so tricky. Um, as an evolution and a becoming instead of an arrival point that we have to race to. Because I think when we can reframe it, when we frame it up as an arrival point, we set ourselves up for failure in this very basic way. Like every time if I feel like, okay, I've achieved grief, I can (laughs) check that off of my to-do list. Then anytime a wave hits me, then I feel shame and I feel like, oh, I didn't, I didn't accomplish Mm -hmm. the task at hand. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but also healing is an incredible opportunity for growth. And if you can step onto that path willingly and say, yes, that, that wave hit me and it's got something to show me, then the whole, our whole relationship to healing changes because it's something you become grateful for. And those words sound very thin, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you mean, and I love, I love also the the part that you just said that, like reframing the notion of arrival. Yes, because arrival is a fixation in itself. Yes, and so like a, one way to control fear is to have an arrival point, mm-hmm. and and that's really powerful what you just said. Like, how can we actually because that's in the that's a trauma symptom. It's like even with spirituality, there is a place right. I will practice hard, but then I will right. arrive and then everything right. will be good. <laughs> kind right. of. I will be enlightened. Yeah, yeah right. and then it will be good instead of, yeah, my capacity will grow to be in the movement, mm-hmm. but trauma release, it, re- it releases more movement. So I will mm-hmm. feel more immersed in the movement, but it doesn't mean that I arrived somewhere. I will right. still go through life and experiences but with more capacity and yes. I, and i think that that we that we because that's very common also like in 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 i think many coaching and consulting environments is like okay we go there and then we arrive there and that's our success and, <laughs> and the whole system is so questionable because yeah. what are we what are we actually saying we are mm-hmm. teaching people to stay in their own prison in this kind of framework yes. mm-hmm. and so i love that you brought that i, I think that that's um very powerful and it also like the being more immersed in movement mm. versus the holding that gives us some kind of stability because movement at first, and I will be curious about your experience because sometimes, you know, sometimes people mix their trauma holding with their structure. Yeah. So then they say, oh, that's my structure. And, but when they heal, the mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. kind of holding starts to melt. And then mm-hmm. it feels like actually, oh, my all that I thought is me is kind of melting away. And it's even then it releases fear. Yeah. And I'm curious about your experience when when trauma releases and it it melts into movement. Yeah. How how do you experience that in yourself, maybe and also with your clients? So that we hear a bit of a few different perspectives about yeah. the healing moment. Yeah, for sure. The um the most vivid one is is maybe my own subjective experience. And I can certainly talk about this with clients as well, but I was very much that restricted person. Um, and I would tell this story sometimes. I have to contact this old therapist. The first therapist I had after my father died, I called her on the phone. This was about six or seven months after my father died. And very suddenly he died on Christmas day. It was, you know, he, he had been very healthy. So it was very shocking. And for six months I was like, okay, well, if you go to work, if you continue going to school, if you do all your things, then you are okay. 
And Mm -hmm. so it was very much like a tightening, a constricting around this broken thing, this, this death. And, um, then I started having panic attacks and Mm -hmm. the panic attacks started getting in the way of work, which was my proof that I was okay. And so I called this therapist on the phone and I left this hilarious, not hilarious at the time, but later hilarious message where I said, you know, um, so I had a loss uh, about six months ago. I'm doing just fine, processing it, absolutely okay. Um, but I've started to have some panic attacks. And so I'd like to do like maybe six sessions, um, figure that out so that I can continue working. <laughs> so you can imagine like getting that right. message and being like, oh boy, right. this is going to be a fun <laughs> therapeutic relationship. Um, and I did not know it at the time, but I think what was happening was exactly what you described was that this constriction had come to a breaking point. Mm -hmm. And that had been my coping tool from when I was tiny all the way until that moment I was 24. And um, then when that broke open, everything was different. And it was like the horizon completely expanded, which is at the same time, a beautiful and terrible thing. Mm -hmm. Because I did not know how to be in the world. I did not know how to be in relation. I had lost all of my signposts and my metrics for whether you're doing okay. Like it felt like a complete loss of control. Mm. And it was an incredible amount of work just to even get through a day, like to, to complete the tasks of living because everything was so raw and, and different, um, And I'm so grateful for the therapist that I had and the people I had in my life for helping me stay with that because the temptation is to go right back to constriction Mm. in in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly a pull. Um, And it's not like I've conquered this by any means, but I'm in a relationship with it in a very different way so that when the constriction comes in, I'm aware of it. And I say like, oh, okay, so we're feeling out of control. (laughs) We would like to know something. We would like to have a fixed point of... um, arrival, as you say, Mm. I want to know, I'm going to complete these three steps and then things will be better. Um, And how can I sit with this instead? And can I sit with this for four seconds? And can I, and then distract myself? And can I, now can I sit with it for 30 seconds and then distract myself, you know, this kind of pendulation into the discomfort Mm. and out. Um, And then the expansion just becomes the horizon and the world feels safe again in a totally different way. And I think the payback if anyone listening is in that raw time, is that when you can open and stay as much as we can, and I think it's a dance, um, then the thing you get back in exchange for letting go of your constriction is enrichment and awe and awareness and, and more intimate relationship, both with other people, yourself, and also this wild thing of being in the world you know Mm, that's beautiful it's also touching how you how you speak about that experience Mm. with a lot of kind of vulnerability transparency i think that's also part that also a sign of your healing process that you can frame it that way and hold it and share it with Mm. with the world in that way and i think you you because i have seen many many people in our groups exactly in that point Mm. and i think having a relational system or some relational support that can help us to stay with it mm-hmm. as you said yeah. and not shut it immediately down like yeah. and have some encouragement mm-hmm. in the rough water to be in the rough water mm-hmm. and so that and then to do it skillfully yeah. and now i would love to see what maybe to hear you talk a bit about the importance of that relational mm. context what's what's relating and a relational support doing mm-hmm. for us um on a human level we can describe it in an academic level neuroscientific level so let's talk a bit about the holding space like a home yeah. where our yeah. trauma can land mm-hmm. maybe you can speak to that a bit i i love this the most my um my mom had this friend um, who I think was sort of a mystic. I don't know that she would have called herself that. Um, but she said that there are moments when we fall off the edge of language. 
Mm-hmm. And I love that so much because I think that when we try to describe what this is like, we fall off the edge of language, which is both frustrating and amazing because it means you get to always keep trying to <laughs> describe it, you know? Um, I think that we have a lot of the way that our society is structured and the way that we go about our lives, a lot of it is about hiding and discipline. Um, and I think actually going back to my experience with panic, I think that this is one of the ways that, that the, the trauma response biologically is so brilliant because it was like knocking on the door to try to get my attention and I wouldn't pay attention Mm -hmm. until it got in the way of what I needed to continue to function. So it, it like, it, it sought its way and it was like, oh, work is the thing. If we interrupt her work, <laughs> then she'll mm-hmm. listen. And it went directly there, which I think is really fascinating and, and kind of really a miracle, a painful miracle, but a miracle. Um, and so I think a lot of what we do as we develop is create these structures to protect us from vulnerability and from each other. And uh, that's not a fault or a pathology. It's just sort of the way that it works. And I think that um, relational spaces are spaces that break down those structures and barriers when we can be together in conversation and have that wild me too experience. Like if I describe something from my childhood, that's really unique and I've never talked about and you say, Oh my God, me too. I loved that same exact experience. Then we've now connected in this way that transcends uh, our bodies and our structures and our defenses. And it creates this like other thing, this energetic thing that is now this connection. Um, and I think we, so I think we relate and it's healing all the time, even when we're not directly trying to heal. You know, if you are in a store and you have a funny exchange with the person who's checking you out, you know, when you leave, that's, that's a relational space where something beautiful is being created, where we are transcending ourselves. And I think when it comes to healing, I think we like to make this, this very complicated but it's actually really very simple, which is just that if I can be with you in overwhelm, then you're no longer alone in overwhelm. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a thousand ways we do that. But, you know, if, when I'm working with a client, if they are struggling to describe something that's very, um, very painful and they start having an emotional response and they start to tear up, um, and their impulse is to race. Let me finish this sentence. Let me hide this emotion. But they let it, you know, they let it free just a tiny little bit. If I can just sit there with them and feel that feeling with them, maybe tear up a little bit myself, take that space, allow that pause, like hold back the 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 race for them and with them, then that's a place where we are now together in this, in what used to be a completely isolated awful, terrifying experience. Mm. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. I, I even also described in, in, I think, Healing Collective Trauma that, and also in a tune that, and it speaks very much to what you said, I think a symptom of a collectively traumatized world is mm-hmm. my fear. Yes. Like that emotions become personal properties versus mutual spaces. Mm-hmm. And what you just described is that when somebody is afraid and I feel that person and say, yeah, I feel that you are scared or afraid, then f- we create a mutual space and the fear is actually our meeting ground. It helps yeah. us, like it becomes the connection unit. And mm-hmm. that resonance is, is deeply healing. Mm-hmm. And so, but I think... The fact that we live in a world where that's often not happening, where people ask each other, like, what do you feel? If I don't feel what you feel, if it's a therapeutic intervention, then it's great because it it animates you to feel yourself. Mm -hmm. But if I ask because I don't know what you're feeling, then my emotional resonance is not picking up on on what you feel. Even if you're overwhelmed and numb, so I would feel that. But Mm -hmm. or if you're a bit scared or joyful or whatever, so there's emotional resonance speaks to each other. But often we we don't feel that in Mm -hmm. society. And that gap I think is 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 a is a symptom that we are collectively hurt yeah. mm-hmm. and because it's so prevalent it's not sure there's only two people expressed it it's, right. it's billions of people expressed it. right, and, right. Uh, 
So it's a systemic issue, right? But I love what you said about the resonance and the sitting together with that overwhelm or with the emotion. And, and that is a mutual space. Yeah, the image that I just got when you were talking is like of two little kids. You have an example that's similar to this in Attuned where you talk about how if something scary is happening in a crowd and you look at an, another stranger, you kind of immediately regulate each other. Like, mm -hmm. oh, it's okay. You know, or if you're in a plane and you're scared because there's turbulence and you look at the stewardess and they and you know they are very calm, then you can feel calm. But the image that I just got while you were talking was of two kids, two little kids who are very afraid. Something terrifying is happening. And then they just sort of, without speaking or looking at each other, link hands. And it changes the temperature of the <laughs> entire thing. Nothing has changed outside. Like the terror is still there and whatever's happening is still happening. But with that, with that connection, things feel and are completely different. It changes the nature of the experience, which is like mind bending. That's right. That's right. That's beautiful. So how do you see the role of... So we talked about two-way relationships, like mm -hmm. interpersonal relationships. How does this look like? What is the role of community? What's the role of groups? Mm -hmm. What's the role of society in that? So when we expand a bit the radius, mm -hmm. teams in organizations. So how 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 important is or what what's the role and what's the contribution of mm -hmm. groups to trauma healing? I think there's so much hope here and it's actually really exciting because I think that the we we hyper focus on the individual our individual problems and then our individual relationships but when we spin out just a little bit when we expand that circle just a little bit we have so much more energy to heal the thing that matters a lot is that we have similar and aligned goals so I think anytime we can get a group together that has a goal say of destigmatizing trauma that has incredible power. If that's 20 people who want to understand how trauma, how traumatic experience impacts us, what that means about our adaptability, and then how to deal with the kind of traces the trauma can leave in its wake, that expands. And now it's not just one person talking to one person, it's 20 people who are regulating each other and themselves all at the same time, and then are going to go out into the world. Clinically, there is, um, as you know, tons of um, positive research about the power of the group modality because it's more expansive than a singular one-on-one -on -one therapeutic relationship. And um, I think societally, we, we have thought for a very long time that we can relegate trauma to, to, you know, to pathology. We can say that this is a rare experience that some people struggle with and we can, most of the rest of us can basically ignore it. We can pretty much bet that we will live a trauma-free life. I think we've had that illusion for a very long time. And I think the last five or six years have really shattered that illusion and people are really struggling because they have had a structure mm -hmm. that they had in place that they didn't know was in place that has been shattered. And mm -hmm. so I think that's a terrible thing and it feels awful. And we can see the reverberations of that in the rage that we encounter on the daily, just in traffic or at the grocery store, people are not okay. Um, but I think that the, the hope there is that now that we can get rid of that illusion, we can get closer to the truth, which is that a part of what it means to be human is to face traumatic, unbearable experiences. And when we all know that and get on the same page and don't look at that as pathology, then we can attune on the individual level, on the group level, mm -hmm. and on the societal level. So I find, I feel like we are in this place of unprecedented hope right now. And maybe that's its own illusion, but um, I think that it's been very scary and dark, but I think it's also, it's also very, very hopeful because we can, this is the stuff. These are the times when we really change the definition of things and start relating mm -hmm. to experiences more differently. And there's so much work right now um, that people are just very clearly very hungry for about attunement, about awe, about expansion, about spirituality outside of a traditional institutional religion, you know? So I think we're really kind of, we're in a, in a, in a precarious place, but I, I feel it to be hopeful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Me too. And I and I I want to underline a few things that you said. I also yes. think that groups are 
very powerful vessels. Mm -hmm. And I think if we lift, if you don't think about, on the one hand, resolving trauma through millions and millions one-on-one sessions, I mean, they are also needed. And some people really have very complex life stories. They need a, a very uh, protected environment, of course. But I have seen a massive acceleration of healing, even when many therapists work in our group context, the the amount of like the speed of the healing process is much higher when the one-on-one -on -one sessions happen in a bigger community space that has that intention, as you said, mm -hmm. that it holds an intention. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this many times, and sometimes uh, the therapists that work in our in our programs say like what takes me five one-on-one -on -one sessions we resolve here in 20 minutes yeah because this the, the the whole quality the whole atmosphere of the group is so much more charged and as you said you have so much more energy available so much more resources than focusing on on just the individual because yeah. the ecosystem is is very conducive to this yes. i i i find that very hopeful and 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 there is something else that I, I would love to bounce off with you. So when we say we are both hopeful about that, mm -hmm. and we also, the other thing I wanted to say to underline in what you said is um, we are not talking about getting to an end point. You said mm -hmm. that. But we are we are talking about resilience is the capacity to stay related to challenging moments, and sometimes there are very overwhelming moments, as you said, and they are traumatizing. Mm -hmm. But I think through good inner work, we strengthen the resilience that there are at least more and more moments that we can stay related to, somehow mm -hmm. even if it's difficult. But that's that's a power that's growing. I think we need in this kind of very crisis moments yes. but there is there is a given what we just said i think that we have been born into a world that is that was already traumatized when we arrived here it's not just we came here everything was great and now suddenly everybody <laughs> is traumatized like there were thousands <laughs> of years of trauma before us and we don't mm -hmm. know how it's going to look like after us <laughs> but the what I want to say is, there is, in my understanding, and tell me how you look at this, there is no real architecture, like hospitals, an architecture to take care of people that need urgent care. Mm -hmm. But I don't see a mainstream architecture in society that would be a collective holding space for dealing with like developing an architecture that can take care of the individual intergenerational and collective trauma aspects, the legacy that our cultures have, being it mm -hmm. 400 years of racism in the US and Native American genocide, colonialism, mm -hmm. the Holocaust, like there are many reverberating after effects of trauma in all around the world. And so, but I don't see an architecture that is, this, that is the healing architecture, like hospitals for client yeah. patients. I don't see anything. And I'm wondering about two things. One is how to bring it into life mm -hmm. and why it's not there. Mm. And so maybe I hand that over to you. <laughs> I, lo I love this question because... I have I have such a vivid image as as you were speaking of, and I've literally never thought about this. I like I kind of love that you highlighted that there is no architectural structure because I, I never have thought about it in, the, in those words. But as you were speaking, I was like building one. You know? <laughs> like, what would that look like to have a hospital, to have a space where the intention, the central intention, was to hold space, was to be a relational home was mm -hmm. to give people and their overwhelm a dwelling place. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I think I immediately see hope there. And then the other question is, and the, I think these questions are related, how to bring it about, and then also why isn't it here? And I think it isn't here because we are ashamed of our emotional experience. We are ashamed of overwhelm. We have taught ourselves that the um, proof of success is to um, to manage 
to manage our emotions and to have our vulnerability in check and only be vulnerable in certain very specific ways. And we have really demonized fear and symptom and overwhelm as a sign of weakness. And it's possible that there, that that was necessary. That was an, in fact, it probably is a necessary movement through just the timeline of humanity. Maybe we didn't, maybe fear was a luxury that we couldn't, um, indulge for a very long time. But if we are in a different place now and we are aware of the way that trauma is getting in the way and the way that our shame is getting in the way, then what could we do? So I think the first work, you know, if you think about architecture and building, you have to break ground first, right? And I think the first thing, the first work to do is to chip away at the stigma that says that vulnerability is weakness and that trauma is a sign of weakness or disorder, um, to chip away at the pathology and and look at experiences in from a much less judgmental frame. And then we can start building, okay, if we can do that, then what would people need? And then how how do we facilitate that? And the thing that I imagine right away is a space to do exactly what you were just describing so beautifully is to hold these groups where you can accelerate um, that relation, relational home, the creation of that relational home in a, mm-hmm. in a scalable way that isn't just this one-on-one, although of course some people will need that. I think probably all of us need that at some level. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm being kind of vague, but I, I love the question. I don't know how to bring it about. I think the, the the task at hand feels to me like it is about cr- creating spaces where people don't feel ashamed for the way that their systems have tried to adapt to overwhelm. Mm. Like instead yeah. of judging yourself for what you reached for in desperation, could you recognize that you reached for it in desperation and then take that, what you reached for as important information about what you need? Mm. Yeah, I love that. I, I I also agree that like what you just said is very powerful. Like the hiding mechanism and the stigmatization of so-called weaknesses, all the parts that we attribute to trauma, like that we should not have, mm-hmm. and like also prevent us having or creating naturally as an emergence, like an architecture, like a collective healing architecture where the society takes care of its own traumatization, Mm -hmm. like a healing architecture around nations, you know, Mm -hmm. or in nations, so that we don't stay in the repetition compulsion of trauma, but that we actually, Mm -hmm. like, pass on something new to, Mm -hmm. like, in ourselves, but also to the next generations. And yep. and I think you beautifully highlighted that, that the more we destigmatize it, the healing architecture can come into being mm-hmm. because it will suddenly have the importance that it actually mm-hmm. needs right. to create heal- a healing environment. And mm-hmm. and uh, that's that's beautiful. And I think that's also the way how we bring it into, into existence. And one way to bring it into existence is first to highlight that it's not there and mm-hmm. that there is a strong right. need that we don't that we don't recognize yet mm-hmm. that we have because otherwise we keep recreating the same cycles right and then we pass it on to the next generations so that's like we know too much about trauma to continue like that yes 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 (laughs) yeah yeah right so i mean i see our time i find it like i feel very energized by our conversation Mm -hmm. is there is there anything that you think we didn't talk about or you want to share with our listeners that is important for you that we didn't touch on or anything, any kind of concentrated summary or like anything you want to share that uh, we leave our listeners with? I think one thing, and this has kind of been underneath everything that we've been talking about is that overwhelm is a part of existence. And so if you're feeling overwhelmed, number one, it's not your fault. You're not doing anything wrong. Number two, we live in a very overwhelming time. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, that is, you know, look, you can, there's someone within 50 feet of you who's also feeling overwhelmed, you know? Um, and I don't lost track of the numbers, but <laughs> the next thing, um, is that that overwhelm will not take you down. You're not going to drown in mm-hmm. this emotion that you've been holding back. Cause I think that's a thing that 
I certainly experience that. And I see that a lot with clients is that when we start to kind of open the door to what we've been trying to close back for, for our whole lives, what's behind that door can feel like it's going to wreck everything. Hmm. And it, it won't, it won't. Emotions are biological events. They hit like waves. They take you out. Sometimes they bring you to your knees, but that doesn't mean you're going to be taken out. Um, nobody drowned in an emotion, you know? Um, and then the last thing is just, could you open yourself up a tiny bit to what, if you're feeling overwhelmed, which so often tips into rage and irritation, could you soften to that a little bit in yourself and in whoever's around you that you're feeling that with and, and try to open to curiosity about what their experience might be or how they might look at your experience were you to tell them. Beautiful. Thank you so much. This is Thank great. You so much. The the hour flew by like it did, this, really uh, did. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I look at the time and wow, we, it's an hour that passed now, and uh, it was so energizing, lively, and interesting. So thank you very much. I deeply enjoyed this, and who knows how we how we continue and where we continue a conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It has been mm. an honor. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, pointofrelationpodcast.com, and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support. <laughs>